Hello, I'm Roy Ratnaville, and good evening. In 1986, during the Civil War, I was 16 years old and living in a small northern coastal town called Point Pedro in Sri Lanka. Along with a group of my friends, I was arrested for no reason other than guilty of being a Tamil, a minority group in Sri Lanka. We were a whole generation of young men who had found ourselves on the wrong side of Sri Lanka's racial order. We were forced to march to a prison across the field which was known to have had landmines. We knew every step we took was the last one. Some of my friends never made it. I lost them forever. I also lost hope for humanity. I was badly tortured in prison. I still bear some scars. Sensing that there's no future for me in Sri Lanka, my father decided to send me out to West for a better and safe life and thought Canada might be the land of opportunity. At the High Commission in the capital city of Colombo in Sri Lanka, the visa officer, Robert Orr, not to be confused with Bob, uh, hockey legend Bobby Orr, <laughs> asked me if he had any proof that I was affected by the Civil War. I just took my shirt off and that was enough for him to give me a visa to Canada. It was on April 19, 1988, when I was 18 years old, that I landed at Toronto Pearson International Airport by myself. The first thing I noticed was the uniformed officers staffing the airport security and custom desk. Arriving from Sri Lanka, a country where my members of my Tamil community are routinely abused by country's police and army, I had learned to associate such uniforms with terror. When I saw two well-built Canadian police officers walking toward me, I tensed reflexively. But as we passed through the corridor, they merely looked at me and said, good afternoon, with big smiles. It was at that moment I decided to become a Canadian. My father was killed three days after I landed in Canada on April 21st in 1988. A single bullet killed him at the age of 53 a piece of me gone, my flesh and blood, my father, myself. My father sending me here was his lasting legacy, his gift to me. So I had to make sure his dying wishes were realized. So I started working, studying, did many odd jobs like factory work, security guard, and cleaning office buildings. Finally, I got a permanent job in a mail room on Bay Street. I paid keen attention to what made people successful. My ticket out of the mailroom came when I bonded with one of company's rising star over our shared love for designer ties. <laughs> Weeks later, on my first encounter with this man, I saw a bag full of ties on my desk. In the bag, there were great brand names in the likes of Amani, Boss, Brioni, and Xenia. Needless to say, since then, I was the best dressed mailroom guy on Bay Street. <laughs> I'm not a fan of copying from C students. I prefer to copy from an A student. I copied most of what he did because he was a mega success. He must have noticed because he got me out of the mailroom and moved me to many roles, including a sales support position and then to sales. To date, he's my mentor and coach. He is the executive chairman of the board of my company. 10 years later, at the age of 28 in 1998, he encouraged me to leave Toronto to gain a broader experience. I decided to take his advice and moved west again and ended up right here in Vancouver. We had about $2 billion in business in Western Canada. For the next 18 years, I learned the lesson on how to build a business. I cannot think of a small town I have not been between Winnipeg and Victoria. Then in 2006, I rose to manage the Western operation. I was like Putin, I had many time zones. <laughs> Smart teamwork along with some unforeseen luck, we built the business in the West to about $40 billion from two billion. That was sweet. 18 years later, my mentor asked me to move back to Toronto to lead the company's efforts nationally. Now as an executive of this corporation, I get to do this again. When I arrived, English was not my first language, but my hopes and dreams were recognizably Canadian. I wasn't shocked by the snow or by the num lung-numbing cold in the winter. What bowled me over was the kindness of Canadians, the kindness of West, 
and Canada propel me here. A lot of people I know go to the lowest common denominator argument. I didn't get there because of racism, they say. If you keep telling your children there's some shadowy white figure out there who are trying to keep you down in life, they're not going to try. Yes, occasionally I have learned insensitive, ignorant comments. My dear departed father used to say, you can't control what people say, you can only control how you react to it. I knew if I want to be successful, I can't be going around being offended by everything. This is a lesson my wife and I teach my son, our son, every day. I still suffer from anxiety and survivor's guilt inherited from Sri Lanka. Some of my family members and friends never escaped. But in time, I was able to build a new life. It is hard to enjoy the Canadian dream when your nightmares leave you racked with survivor's guilt. My past constantly plays in my head in an endless loop. But the one who makes all this manageable in my head is a lovely young lady I met decades ago. Her name is Sue, and she's my wife, and she's in the room tonight. Thank you, Sue. It is too hard to fathom for a 16-year-old kid who thought he would never see the age of 17. But I st as I stand here in front of you today, almost 30 years later, at the age of 47, as a husband, as a father, I owe a huge debt of gratitude to Canada and the West. Who knows how things would have turned out. 30 years ago, that was always around the corner in Sri Lanka. The West, Canada, gave me a second lease on life. To me, Canada was the much needed prosthetic to my amputated soul, an anchor of my own human dignity. I now realize this more than ever. Every time I think of Canada, the West, I am reminded of the Irish saying, when I count my blessing, I count you twice. My loyalty to this land is marrow deep and is intact. With every passing day, no matter the rage inside me, no matter the pain in my heart, no matter the nightmares in my head, there are some moment, some beauty, some extraordinary display of life through an 18-year-old boy who arrived here in Canada by himself, helps me breathe, helps me smile, helps me to be grateful for all that I have, all that I am, and all that I am becoming. Ladies and gentlemen, there is hope for humanity.